you could see a fireball coming through the floor. Then the room started to fill up with smoke. But immediately, you could not see your hand if it's right in front of your face. It was that dark. Tiles were falling. The, the walls were crumbling. You were trying to catch a breath. blue skies, uh, a nice day in September. Uh, we came to work, nothing particularly outstanding in the news that day. At the Pentagon, I was the assistant building manager. Um, I was responsible from A to Z, uh, lights on, uh, place warm, just about anything you needed done at the Pentagon. We all went to our normal jobs shortly after uh, my assistant came up to me and told me that I might want to come out and see what was going on. One of the Trade Center towers was smoking uh, on the screen and she had said it just got hit by an airplane. I was at working at the firehouse that morning we were having our uh, shift meeting, and uh, one of the guy's wives calls and says that, uh, hey, something happened in New York. A plane flew into the World Trade Center. I grew up in New York, and I was like, well, planes aren't supposed to be flying near the World Trade Center. You know, it's just not in the flight path. So we turned the news on, and um, sure enough, you know, the building is, is on fire, and it was like, wow, that's insane. This is my third tour of duty in the Pentagon when I was a Navy captain, and I was the special assistant to the vice chief of naval operations, who was the number two admiral in the Navy. We have a TV in the vice chief's outer office, and you could see in the video, perfectly clear day, this is no navigational mal malfunction. The pilot can see where he's flying. The pilot knows exactly what he's doing. We knew that this was intentional from the beginning. Can you see God about 4,000 feet, about 5 East Airport right now? Looks like he's... Yeah, I see him. Did you see God? Look, is he descending for the building also? He's descending really quick too, yeah. I worked at the Boston Air Route Traffic Control Center. I was a military liaison, and after the second impact by United 175, then things got really, really uh, confusing, uh, chaotic. He was in Whiskey 105. Uh, we have an unconfirmed report of second airplane just to the World Trade Center. The feeling of losing control to a controller is like those times just before you fall asleep and you feel like you're falling and then you catch yourself. And it's, it's kind of scary for a half a second. Well, I felt that for about two hours. So escalating big, big time. And we need to get the military involved with us. Wow, what's going on? Just get me somebody who has the authority to get military in the air now. All right. I believe it was close to 4,000 aircraft that were in the sky already. We had to coordinate each one individually. And after the two impacts, any aircraft that made any uncharacteristic action at that time was going to be perceived that it could possibly be a hijack. American 77, Indy. American 77, American. Indy radio check. How do you read? 
American 77 was uh, departed Dulles for Los Angeles. And somewhere along the way in Indianapolis Center's airspace, the hijackers turned off its transponder so you could no longer see the aircraft with our radar. Uh, turned the aircraft around, headed back to the East Coast. And we also lost American 77. Okay. They lost radar with him, they lost contact with him, they lost everything, and they don't have any idea where he is or what happened. I was a reporter for the Washington Post. My assignment was uh, covering the Pentagon as an installation, uh, a large military installation in the Washington region. We have just been attacked in, in an act of war. This is the military's command center. And the Pentagon, when it was built, there was criticism at the time that what the military was creating was the, the world's largest bombing target. You can't really get a grasp for how big the Pentagon is until you see it from the air. The Pentagon, in a way, is, is five separate buildings that are built next to each other. It's these five wedges. You also have five rings that divide it up further. By any measure, it's the biggest office building in the world, a building with 17 miles of corridors, a 35-acre roof, a building where 20,000 people would go to work every morning. Always chilly in the building. I always have my sweater. The military gives you a black sweater to wear. Told my office mate, Marion, I'll see you. I went off to the meeting that was not far from our cubicle, and Marion stayed in the office, continuing to um, um, process her work that she had to do for that day. The meeting started at 9 o'clock. And so we had no idea what was going on in the country at that time. Hey, put on. Well, my dad is Washington. Give me a location. That's the ones we had a third aircraft hijack heading towards Washington. And we get a report that a large aircraft is six miles south of the White House. So right away, I'm like, this needs to go to Northeast Air Defense Command. They need to know. Uh, latest report, the aircraft is flying six miles southeast of the White House. Six miles southeast of the White House? Foxy, I got an aircraft six miles east of the White House. We just flying to the huge Foxy. We got a call from the Navy Command Center. I picked it up, and it was the duty watch captain, Jerry DeContoin. And Jerry and I had been fellow physics majors at the academy, and he's a good friend. And Jerry said, a plane has been hijacked out of Dulles Airport. That's all we know. And so, we got it. You know, keep us, keep us informed. I was one of three firefighters assigned to the Pentagon Heliport Fire Station. The fire station is located approximately 20 feet west of the Pentagon itself. That morning, the fire chief from Fort Myer will call. He said, something like what has happened in New York City could possibly happen in this area. If it did, you would likely be responding to it. My office was on the E-ring, the outermost portion of the Pentagon, the part with windows so you can actually look out. And I realized uh, the White House is very difficult to see from the air. It's not all that big of a building. The Washington Monument, symbolic, but silly. Capitol building would be symbolic, but there aren't a lot of people in the Capitol building. And, and then I just kind of thought out loud and I said, it's coming here, it's gonna hit us. I had received an email from security that advised me there was no change in the security posture and we would be remaining the same at this time, but they would get a hold of me if there was a change. And so um, we wait for a report from the command center, anything, no nothing. Then I say to my boss, I'm gonna go down there and my boss says, stay put, let them work. They'll call when they have something. And so um, I didn't go. We were conducting our meeting and it got to my turn to pass information out. I went back to my desk and sat down. Suddenly you, you hear a sound. It was my turn to speak. 
that's when you heard a loud noise. And the sound grows in intensity, and you recognize, yeah, that's an airliner. A flash or something over to my left will catch my attention. When I look up, I see the airplane. And it keeps getting louder and louder, and you say, is this really happening? I turn my back to the airplane, and I am running. This is not the way my life is supposed to go. Is this how it ends for me? And then before you can even really think much more, Felt a jolt. I was blown to the opposite side of the table. Loud explosion. Feel the pressure from the explosion, and then almost immediately I feel the enormous heat generated by the fireball. Trying to grab onto something for stability. And you can see a clear split and a fireball coming through the floor. And then you heard like particles of concrete falling on the fault ceiling. And then you realize I'm alive. What just happened? What is going on? Fire alarm control screens turned on, and they were counting up. It was like several hundred thousand square feet of Pentagon just burst into flames. Everything in front of me is on fire. The fire truck is a big blaze. It was nothing but a field of burning debris. The hall outside our office starts to fill, not with smoke, but with dust falling from the ceiling. And as I stepped out of the command center, you could see drywall dust rolling down the hallway. It looked like a fog coming in. The side of my face, down my arm, and on my back were burned. But I didn't know that. It was just time to get out of the building. Then the room started to fill up with smoke. You could not see your hand if it's right in front of your face. It was that dark. I will enter the fire truck from the passenger side door, climb over the radio consoles, plop down in the driver's seat. My plan is to take it over where the airplane has struck the building. The fire truck, however, will not move. As a matter of fact, it never moved. The back of the fire truck has got a blaze on it, probably 50 feet high. I and two of the officers in the room run out. There were no people in the hallway. Couldn't figure out why there's no fire alarm going off. We have to get out of here. The closest door that was to me was burning, flaming hot. So I knew not to open that door. I knew windows were on the C ring on the second floor. And that's the way I started to crawl. We're running down the E ring, and the smoke's getting thicker and thicker um, to the point where we're having trouble seeing. And then suddenly, the building was missing. Uh, there was just a big hole there where there was just a building not a minute ago. I mean, this is the military's command center. You have a building that needs to swing into action to start dealing with this new war. As a reporter, your instinct is to go to the scene. And as I got closer, there was this uh, enormous black plume in the middle of this beautiful blue sky morning in Washington. You had this. Uh, this ugly plume of black smoke. From where I was standing, you could see these Navy personnel who had come to help pull people out of the damaged area, which was the Navy Command Center. You could see the water between ankle and half calf deep. It wasn't occurring to me, it was jet fuel. The plane struck the building right at, at about a 40 degree angle. The wings pretty much disintegrated upon impact, uh, but the, the fuselage blew open a hole in the wall in the limestone facade of the Pentagon, and, and the rest of the aircraft followed in and continued all the way through the E ring, the D ring, the C ring. When the plane came through, if you can imagine a room full of partition furniture, and you have this force coming through there, it's taking all of that furniture and people people and everything. This hole were popped out. It was kind of into that area where everything had been shoved into.
Um. Yeah. I left the building through what's called the mall entrance. And the and first thing you could see, obviously, is smoke and flame. And as I get closer and closer, I see bits and pieces of something littering the grass, the field. And the first thing that was recognizable was a big piece of the fuselage. Um, it was white with a big red A on it, American Airlines. And then I came around the outbuilding and then it was like a dream sequence because uh, there before me were some um, either dead or gravely injured people laying on the ground. I see the fire truck and it's on fire. I look and the fire truck cab door is open and in there I see what looks to be a body slumped over the steering wheel of the fire truck. And when I run up to him, he, he kind of sits upright and I realize he's not dead. I think I, at this point I have my face down in the dash trying to determine what's wrong with the fire truck. The fire truck will not move. Eventually I will make a radio call. I simply say, Foam 61, Fort Myer, we have had a commercial airliner crash into the west side of the Pentagon. I was a captain with Arlington County Fire Department. We're stationed at uh, Crystal City, whether it's medical emergency, uh, fire alarm, anything, we're the first ones there. When we pulled up, there were, there were a lot of people exiting the Pentagon, a lot of confusion. The instinct of a lot of people who work at the Pentagon is to run to the sound of the guns, run to the smoke, run to the fire. And that's what a lot of people did, going in and, and you know, pulling strangers out of cubicles, just catching people who are trying to, to get out windows, all kinds of uh, heroes and people absolutely risking their lives to go back, you know, after they'd escaped themselves and go back to get others. And we realized, to use Navy language, our shipmates are in there. We need to go in. Fire department says, you can't go in. You're not qualified. You're not outfitted. Uh, it was very emotionally charged atmosphere, but uh, they were eager to try and tell us, hey, this is where this person is. This is how you get here. So then we started <clears throat> drawing diagrams for them, OK? I'd like you to go check the Navy Command Center. Jerry was in there. There's another good friend, Pat Dunn. And you have no idea whether they're still alive or they're dead. That's when we went to work. If they were in an office that was cordoned off, they still might be OK. Uh, we entered to the right of where the plane came in. As I crawled out, I could feel like something was pulling me. I'm just yelling out, who is that? Stay with me, hold on to me. Because you couldn't see anything. So I'm figuring if I'm talking, you could hear me. And I'm saying, if anybody else is there, join the line. We're getting out of here. Hold on, hold on. I'm talking so much that my mouth is now drying out. And I grabbed my black sweater, and I just kind of sucked on it because it's wet, not knowing it was jet fuel. As you have the tower collapsing at the World Trade Center, you have a, a situation at the Pentagon where you have a fire that is only getting worse. Uh, you have an unknown number of victims, people trapped, 
and it could be getting worse in a hurry. When we were crawling down the uh, corridor, um, conditions started deteriorating. The smoke started pushing out a little more forcefully. Uh, the temperature started to rise, and there was more uh, cracking and popping going on, and there's very, very limited visibility. We were probably about 12, 15 feet away from the door we needed to get to. And then all of a sudden, uh, a very loud noise. We started hearing what sounded like a, an, you know, an earthquake sound. Building materials and ceiling tiles, everything came crashing down on us. And that's, then you could see that the, the building started collapsing in on itself. Very loud noise, a lot of debris falling on us. Was concerned that we weren't going to uh, make it out. Did one of the crew get injured or killed? But you know there's more people in there. You wonder how far this collapsing is going to progress. Are adjacent walls going to tumble in? Are they trapped? Um, what's going on? When people are looking at the building, you know, on, on television cameras, that gash looks quite small. It looks almost like a pinprick. But in reality, the sheer size of the destruction was equivalent to a large shopping mall. It was an absolutely horrific scene. We were kind of scattered. We got back together. And it's, it's emotions are up and down. You know, you, you find out that, no, everybody's OK. <clears throat> That's a good feeling. OK, we're good. We made it through this. But the people were still in there, and you're trying to save somebody, and you're not able to save them. That sticks with you. You just have a very tenuous situation at the Pentagon at a time of, of great chaos, uncertainty, fear, and, and unknown. You, you need the Pentagon to function as a, as a command center. But you have more jet fuel inside. The building is starting to ignite. You have an unknown number of victims, people trapped. An enormous rescue operation is getting underway with more and more first responders, you know, urban rescue type uh, personnel. Primary goal of a recon team is to find victims that are trapped, that can't get out by themselves. Our mission is, is to find them and assist the rescue team in removing them safely from the building. Uh, when they're going into the building, um, I have to help assess what's going on with the structure. Is it safe to go into this particular area? And try to help them find the safest way to do their job. And as we were driving in, uh, the building's still on fire. Smoke was the thing I remember. And that, the, the closer we got, the more we could see. As we arrived, we could see the street lights that had been hit by the plane on, the, on its way in. So this is the first visions that we see of the Pentagon. I was feeling anxious about what I'm going to do, what, what I was going to be asked to do, because I didn't know if I was ready, if I had, I had no field experience whatsoever. And it looked like it was a very intense situation. And at this time, we've got people who are coming out of the Pentagon who are injured. Yeah, I was running on adrenaline during this period of time. I had this kind of tunnel vision thing where I don't remember things that were happening on the periphery. I only remember exactly what I was staring at, like I was looking through a soda straw. I thought I saw a movement inside this door that, where the smoke was billowing out. It was a woman, and we half-lifted, half-dragged her um, out of the building, and, and she was one of these where her skin was coming off in sheets. You want to grab her arms, but as you do, the skin comes off. And, um, and so then you, tr you think, oh, I gotta let go, but wait, no, we gotta get her out, what do I do? So you just do the best you can, grab clothes, grab whatever you can. 
the first ambulance pulled up and you call him over and you need oxygen. Guy pulls out one oxygen bottle. You've got five, six people laying down on the side of the road here. Who do you give it to? So I'm leaning over this woman and she seems to be struggling. And she says, am I gonna die? And I said, no, what's your name? And she said, my name is Antoinette. And I said, you're not gonna die, Antoinette. Um, we got a helicopter coming, we're gonna put you on it. And so we carried her up to the helicopter and put her in and, and I yelled at her, um, I'll, uh, I'll see you in the hospital. And uh, actually it turned out I'd never got to see her in the hospital. She died before I, I was able to visit her. The timeline is very critical, because the longer they're trapped, the less likely they are to survive. So uh, we went in right to the left of where the plane had hit the, hit the building. We walked into a really, really bad scene. We were met with a chest-high pile of debris. There, there was pieces of, you know, bodies everywhere. Lots of debris and smoke. Smoke kills you pretty quickly, uh, particularly when it's as heavy as it was in, in the Pentagon. Usually, when you know, a building's on fire, just ventilate the building, break a window to let the smoke out. But many of the windows were still in place. They were blast-proof windows. There was no opening in these windows. I mean, we beat them with sledgehammers. The high heat makes it less likely for people to get out. These windows just kept it in there like a giant oven, you know? In my mind, not being an expert, I, I, I was thinking, how could anyone survive this? We continued to crawl. We knew we had to leave to get out of there. And as we continued to crawl, the one lady was just ready to give up. And when she said she could not make it anymore, it's like, oh, yeah, you're going. I am not telling your children I left you. Get on my back. I'm going to carry you out of here if I have to. It seemed like we crawled forever to get to this window. I had no light to see anything. What led me to that window, I knew it was in that direction. And that was the smallest little pinhole of a light. And I just kept crawling straight to that window. And once we got to the window, we just start kicking it and beating on that window. I came down the corridor. I looked up to the next floor level. And there was two or three people in the window. And a person was banging on the window when it would not even crack or give way. And this young soldier, I will never forget him. It was a printer not far from us at this window. And he threw the printer at this window. And it just bounced right back in my lap. The Pentagon had been newly renovated. And the renovations had included blast-resistant windows. They're designed not to come out, not, not to open. The reason they did that was because of the several terrorist acts, including Oklahoma City and the bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Kenya. Most of the people that were killed inside the embassy were, were killed by glass traveling at 100 miles an hour. These blast-resistant windows have saved lives and protected a lot of people inside the building, but they're also preventing a lot of people inside the building from getting out. I started blaming myself. I brought these people to a window, and we can't get out of here. And I'm like, God, I'm going to die. God, take care of my girls. I knew that they're trapped. They can't get out. So I decided I would try and find another way up there. There was a stairway there close. Uh, it was so hot that the paint was blistering on the wall. and the, uh, 
steps were burning my feet through my shoes. And uh, I did not get to those people in the window. Uh, and the guy threw the printer again. The frame popped open just a bit, and the smoke just barreled out of that room. And we were beating on the wind, really the window frame. And the window finally opened. And down below, the people, they looked up and they saw all of the smoke. And they were like, jump, jump, jump. I just knew there were more people. And I told my Colonel, sir, there, there are people in here, we can't go. My Colonel said, this is an order. You get out of this window right now. That was the first order I wanted to disobey, but I knew I had to. And the guys were down there, and I crawled down them. They carried me to a triage, and that's as far as I remember. I am told the rest of the story. Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to find out about, you know, the people inside the building, what's going on with rescue attempts. You know, I, I felt a pit in my stomach as you, you, you didn't know uh, what was going to happen next. Okay, United 93 is 29 miles out of, uh, 29 minutes out of Washington, D.C. 29 minutes out of Washington, D.C. and tracking towards it. We needed fighters up in the sky as quick as we could. Uh, they were basically just the two F-15s at Otis and the two F-16s at Langley that were available. But you just can't call up and say, hey, I need some of your planes. The protocols on 9-11 were designed for a different purpose. It was done through the FAA channels, uh, back down through the Pentagon, through NORAD, and back to the military so they could prepare for probably an act of war but an act of war where enemies were attacking from outside the boundary. They weren't designed for an internal strike. They just didn't work under these conditions because nobody was prepared for what happened on 9-11. So we were trying to get them off the ground as fast as we could. And uh, there's still a lot of confusion going on during all this time period. There is a report of black smoke in the, in the last position I gave you, 15 miles south of Johnstown. Uh, from the airplane or from the ground? Uh, they're speculating it's from the aircraft. Okay. Uh, who, it, it hit the ground. We had found out later that United 93 had gone down in a field in Pennsylvania. But the Pentagon and the FAA Command Center and FAA Headquarters continue to watch this track, and it continues towards Washington, D.C. The nation's future safety depends on the Pentagon being able to, to function as the, the military's command post. The, the National Military Command Center, any time you know, the nation is attacked, this is a place where uh, a lot of important decisions are going to be made. This is where the, um, you know, the communications is based. So a lot of what needed to be put out around the globe was, was there at the Pentagon. It had to keep functioning. Well, we had various areas in the building that are just absolutely die on the sword, last to leave the ship type of organizations. And I received a phone call that the National Military Command Center had smoke coming in through the ventilation system, making it very difficult for them to work. We needed to get the fire put out, but broken pipes caused us to pump about a million gallons of water into the incident scene. By losing our water pressure, we couldn't provide the firefighters with firefighting water. We needed to get that pressure back up, or we were going to have more serious problems. All right, the command. Go ahead. Yes, sir, now we're getting reports of fire on the A&E side. 
Fighting a jet fuel fire is completely different than fighting an office building fire. The jet fuel burns a lot hotter than your normal combustible material, and it was everywhere. The fires continued to pop up because it was hot enough in there for things to reignite. It was happening all over the Pentagon. The guys were looking for survivors. We call out and say, hey, Fairfax County Fire, anybody here hoping that, you know, somebody had locked themselves in the office or were trapped underneath the debris, and we would stop, listen. 99 out of 100 times, you don't hear anything. The internal damage was much more significant than what you see from the street. I, I had to remember to focus on my job because I, I sometimes would get stuck on thinking about the horror of, of what's going on around me. Um, those of us that were working inside realized that we're not likely to find anybody else alive in the building. There were all kinds of speculation from, from the start in the number of casualties. At first, people were saying, well, it, it, it could be uh, dozens, and then we'd hear hundreds, and then some people were saying thousands. Uh, and, and that, of course, was, was completely chilling. Um, and then you have real terror as these reports would come in of another plane, you know, heading towards the Pentagon. Security runs out you know, with radios, and they said, um, there's another plane coming in. We have a code that if you hear a three blast means evacuate the building. We were inside working, we hear three blasts. We evacuated 500 yards away from the building. All you had to evacuate 500 yards away from the building. Based on the Twin Towers, um, a second plane into the Pentagon made sense. And uh, we got to get these people out of here, you know? And so we, we put, like, we stuffed these ambulances with as many people as we could fit in them. We're in there trying to fight the fire, and we have radio communications, and the battalion chief is telling you to evacuate, evacuate immediately. Get back, get back! They got another inbound fight! It was a cascading one seemingly bad thing after another after another. We were advised by security over our radios that we had three additional airplanes inbound with an ETA of about 20 minutes to impact at the Pentagon. You still had the fire threatening the, the National Military Command Center. That's why the Arlington Fire Chief uh, wanted to, to evacuate. But uh, you know they were essentially refusing to leave. There was also fire on the roof that was threatening the uh, antenna complex, which a lot of these communications were based. We knew we had to close off the pipes down in the tunnel to get the water pressure back up to restore these systems. So we had to make a big decision at the time. Six of us stayed in the Pentagon and went down into the steam tunnels to start isolating chill water piping, steam piping, and all necessary to start building our water pressure. These weren't uh, warriors. These weren't combatants. These were plumbers, pipe fitters, electricians. They're just normal, everyday people, and these people did not hesitate. When we went down them, they were full of smoke where you couldn't even see. I was using the armpit of my suit coat to bury my face into to try and breathe through the material to cut down on some of the acrid smoke. Uh, 
and all the time you're hearing the radio go off. Estimated time to impact, 17 minutes. Estimated time to impact, 11 minutes, 9 minutes. Battalion 301 to command. All units on the fire ground, evacuate the building and reposition. All units respond additionally 500 yards from the scene for safety purposes. Course 50 direct. We don't know why we're being evacuated at first. And we get to the center courtyard, and um, they say that there's another plane inbound, and it's you know, going to hit the Pentagon in two minutes. Captain Hannon and four uh, DC guys are inside. I'm trying, attempting to get them out now. They are not out yet. And you're, you're in the center courtyard. It's a half a mile to the outside, you have all your gear on, you're not going to make it, you know, even, you know, um, an incredible athlete's not going to be able to make it out that quickly, so we came out of the tunnel uh, and went back up into the center courtyard. There was this big <clears throat> tree right there, so um, I knelt down, said a prayer. And about that time is when we started hearing uh, a rumble. Remember feeling a lot of comfort because as I looked left and right, there were a lot of other people on their knees. And it was coming louder and louder. And, and I remember just every hair on my body standing up on end. It was, uh, I just wanted my wife and kids to know that if I did die, I was dying doing something I loved doing. You couldn't tell what direction it was coming from, and it just kept getting louder and louder. Then, almost instantaneously, all these military guys are starting to cheer. And it was a fighter. And, OK, I'm pretty confident they didn't hijack any fighters. So I think we're going to be OK. After I seen it pass, it went from being the most horrific moment in my life to probably the most relief I felt. I felt a great exhale, and I said, I don't think anything bad's going to happen next. He came over, you know, dipped his wing, and then you know, was like, Oof, now, we're, now we're safe. Now we have is a fire to fight. One of the tracking systems that we use is a, a general overview of the air traffic system. However, what it's showing is not live traffic. It's showing traffic based on history. If an airplane crashed or if an aircraft had impacted the ground, the system would continue to show that aircraft on its last route of flight. So they're trying to put fighters to go up and intercept it. Uh, they're launching for a ghost. The aircraft doesn't exist. And this created a lot of issues that day. There was still fire up on the roof. And we were told to find an access, get up there. Uh, we stood at the peak and we looked out over the devastation and uh, couldn't believe we were actually seeing uh, the Pentagon in this condition. somebody's, you know, decimated this fortress. Early afternoon, I got a call on my cell phone, which kind of surprised me because nobody had my personal cell phone number. And lo and behold, it was the joint staff office calling. 
asking if the building was stable, if the, we thought things were under control. Of course, we're still burning, um, but as far as systems, we felt we had stabilized things pretty good. Um, I don't know if it was a coincidence I got the call, and within an hour or so later... Uh, it's an indication that the United States government is functioning in the face of this terrible act uh, against our country. I should add that the briefing here is taking place in the Pentagon. The Pentagon's functioning. It'll be in business tomorrow. When uh, Rumsfeld announced that uh, it would be a normal normal has big quotation marks normal day of work the next day uh, we understood that the meaning behind this was showing the world and showing the american people that the pentagon was bruised not broken able to continue on we had that same feeling that it was important to us that the pentagon was not broken we would continue to go. What do we do, tuck tail and leave? No, we're gonna continue to work. We're, we're open for business. The Pentagon has never been closed since the day it opened. In the 60 years up till 9-11, it had never closed for a minute and it never closed on 9-11 and it's never closed since. But as the day started to go on and, and the reality of what had happened sunk in and, you know, the uh, knowledge of, of who had been lost began to become more clear, uh, there were some uh, there were tough times for, for a lot of the people working there. I don't recall what time it was that we came off the roof, but the next thing I remember is being on in the back of this Wheaton Rescue Squad ambulance. and. I was transported to the hospital. Um, they said I had some smoke inhalation and dehydration and um, the emotion I uh, told was a factor as well. When I did get back to the Pentagon, it was real pressing to me that I had to make it back to that room when the fire was out and see what I couldn't see the day before. Feeling guilty not getting those, that group of people out of there. It's one of those things you just have to do, have to, have to face it and move on. When you have a man-made disaster, to see somebody who expects just to go to work one day, that just wants to make a living and have a nice life and, and have it taken away from them like that, it's just, what is it? What do you call it? Yeah. I do feel if the fire truck would have been responsive as, as it should have been, it would have made a difference in the fire, the spread of the fire. And it might have made a difference in, how, in somebody else's life, allowing that person to. I, um, I, but it just didn't happen that way. I've heard it was like 102 minutes. It felt like an eternity for me. Um, we felt out of control. I think a lot of people felt that way on that day as far as controllers. I know I felt that way. I felt like I was always trying to catch up. We just never caught up. Not a lot of people got to see what happened inside the Pentagon. Um, not just the horrors of what's going on inside the building, but the community rallying around that's when I started to get emotional. And um, there were people there uh, with flags and signs. They were there just to support us. I had already reached the decision that I was going to retire from the Navy, wrote a letter requesting retirement, and dropped it in my boss's inbox on uh, the evening of September 10th. After I was um, put in charge of the recovery effort on September 12th for the Navy, I went back into the Pentagon that day to clean the offices of classified material and then remembered that letter I had dropped in his inbox and uh, went and pulled it out and tore it up. 
Every day, I think of Marianne, Dwayne, all of those people in my office. Ron, and his wife was pregnant. She had just told him she was going to have a boy. He was killed because he was in the office with my general. So she and I are still friends, and we just love on that little boy. He looks so much like his father. So he's getting ready to be 15 years old. One of the things that was so important to me on that day was the team that had chose to stay with me that day uh, to stabilize the Pentagon and keep it going. None of these people hesitated. This is not something that they ever prepared for in their mind. They were just normal people who went to work for eight hours a day. And they were my heroes that day. years, I didn't know who you were <laughs> and whether you were alive. 